You know those YouTubers that take 10 minutes to get to the punchline and they bury the lead in the video? Well, that is not me. Folks, let's talk about Flight 10. SpaceX just released that they're planning to launch no earlier than August 24th. That is a Sunday, a very rapidly approaching Sunday. And so Flight 10 is now scheduled for August 24th. I plan to be there and let's talk about what they plan to do and also what they've released about Flight 9 and what went wrong. So for Flight 10, the launch window will open at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. Yes, it will still be light out. By the way, if you're planning on seeing a launch and you have your heart set on seeing a catch by the chopstick arms, maybe don't come for Flight 10 because they are not planning on catching the booster with the chopsticks. I repeat, they're not planning on catching the booster with the chopsticks. So SpaceX writes, after completing the investigations into the loss of Starship on its ninth flight test and the Ship 36 static fire anomaly, hardware and operational changes have been made to increase reliability. The upcoming Flight 10 will continue to expand the operating envelope on the Super Heavy booster with multiple landing burn tests planned. It will also target similar objectives as previous missions, including Starship's first payload deployment and multiple re-entry experiments geared toward returning the upper stage to the launch site for catch. So hopefully they're able to get that door open and we're able to finally see some Starlink simulators deployed. The booster on this flight test is attempting several flight experiments to gather real world performance data on future flight profiles and off nominal scenarios. The super heavy booster will attempt these experiments while on a trajectory to an offshore landing point in the Gulf of America and will not return to the launch site for catch. Following stage separation, the booster will flip in a controlled direction before initiating its boost back burn. This maneuver was demonstrated for the first time on Flight 9 and requires less propellant to be held in reserve, enabling the use of more propellant during ascent to enable additional payload mass to orbit. The primary test objectives for the booster will be focused on its landing burn and will use unique engine configurations. One of the three center engines used for the final phase of landing will be intentionally disabled to gather data on the ability for a backup engine from the middle ring to complete a landing burn. The booster will then transition to only two center engines for the end of the landing burn, entering a full hover while still above the ocean surface, followed by a shutdown and drop into the Gulf of America. The Starship upper stage will again target multiple in-space objectives, including the deployment of eight Starlink simulators similar in size to next-generation Starlink satellites. The Starlink simulators will be on the same suborbital trajectory as Starship, and are expected to demise upon entry. A relight of a single Raptor engine while in space is also planned. And the flight test includes several experiments focused on enabling Starship's upper stage to return to the launch site. A significant number of tiles have been removed from Starship to stress test vulnerable areas across the vehicle during re-entry. Multiple metallic tile options, including one with active cooling, will test alternative materials for protecting Starship during re-entry. On the sides of the vehicle, functional catch fittings are installed and will test the fitting's thermal and structural performance along with the section of the tile line receiving a smooth and tapered edge to address hot spots observed during re-entry on Starship's sixth flight test. Starship's re-entry profile is designed to intentionally stress the structural limits of the upper stage's rear flaps while at the point of maximum entry dynamic pressure. Okay, so that's what's happening for Flight 10, but let's talk about Flight 9 because SpaceX just revealed more details about what happened during that flight, which wasn't quite fully successful. And yes, it was a completely different problem than the ships, the V2 ships had on Flight 7 and 8. So Flight 9, new issue, which they have hopefully fixed. So let's talk about it. So if you can remember all the way back to May 27th of this year, Starship's ninth flight test successfully lifted off at 6.36 p.m. Central Time from Starbase, Texas. The test began with the first super heavy booster to be reflown, starting up successfully and completing a full duration ascent burn with all 33 of its Raptor engines before separating from Starship's upper stage in a hot staging maneuver. 
During separation, Super Heavy performed the first ever deterministic flip, followed by its boost back burn. Deterministic flip. I like that term. And remember, this was a huge milestone that I feel like didn't get enough recognition, the first booster to be reflown, Booster 14. After completing the boost back burn, Super Heavy flew at a significantly higher angle of attack than previous flights during its descent back to Earth, reaching a peak angle of approximately 17 degrees. This trajectory was a flight experiment to gather data on the limits of the booster's performance. Once it reached the planned splashdown area, the booster relit 12 of the planned 13 engines for its landing burn. Shortly after the burn started, an energetic event was observed near the aft end of the vehicle, followed by a loss of telemetry. Final data was received from the booster approximately 382 seconds into flight and at approximately one kilometer in altitude over the designed clear zone. The most probable cause for the failure at landing burn was higher than predicted forces on the booster structure, specifically on the booster's fuel transfer tube due to the increased angle of attack experiment. Post-flight analysis showed that the vehicle loads exceeded the capabilities of the transfer tube, which is believed to have experienced a structural failure, resulting in a mixing of methane and liquid oxygen and subsequent ignition. For the remaining flight tests using this version of the Super Heavy Booster, the angle of attack for booster descent will be lowered to decrease aerodynamic forces and minimize the likelihood of structural failure. SpaceX works with an experienced global response provider to retrieve any debris that may wash up in South Texas or Mexico as a result of Starship flight test operations. During the survey of the expected debris field from the booster, there was no evidence of any floating or deceased marine life that would signal booster debris impact harmed animals in the vicinity. Following a successful stage separation, the Starship upper stage lit all six of its Raptor engines and flew along its expected trajectory. Approximately three minutes into the burn, sensors in the nose cone detected a steady increase in methane levels. Uh-oh. This continued until approximately five minutes into the burn when pressure began to rapidly decrease in the main fuel tank while pressure simultaneously increased in the nose cone. Starship systems were able to compensate for the drop in main tank pressure and completed the ascent burn, achieving the planned velocity in second stage engine cutoff or SECO. After engine shutdown, the elevated nose cone pressure combined with planned nose cone venting led to a large amount of attitude error, which continued to build up until the vehicle's automatic fault systems disabled nose cone venting. The attitude error resulted in the ship automatically skipping the payload deploy objective, which was also unable to be completed as the higher nose cone pressure resulted in adverse loads on the mechanism responsible for opening the payload door. The vehicle was able to gradually decrease its attitude error using the reaction control thrusters until nose cone venting was re-enabled as planned. Roughly 40 seconds after nose cone vents were re-enabled, onboard cameras showed liquid methane entering the nose cone and the temperatures on multiple sensors and controllers started dropping. This eventually triggered automatic passivation commands into the vehicle resulting in Starship skipping the in-space burn and venting all the remaining propellant into space. Starship then re-entered Earth's atmosphere in an off-nominal attitude and communication was lost during entry. Final telemetry from Starship was received approximately 46 minutes into the flight test while the vehicle was approximately 59 kilometers in altitude and inside the designated entry area over the Indian Ocean. There were no autonomous flight safety system mission rule violations or initiation of the flight termination system. SpaceX led the investigation efforts with oversight from the FAA and participation from NASA, the National Transportation and Safety Board, and the United States Space Force. The most probable root cause for the loss of the Starship upper stage was traced to a failure on the main fuel tank pressurization system diffuser. Cameras inside the vehicle showed a visible failure on the fuel diffuser canister, which is located inside the nose cone volume on the forward dome of the main fuel tank. While pre-flight analysis did not show a predicted failure, SpaceX engineers were able to recreate the failure using flight conditions when testing at their facility in McGregor, Texas.
So to address the issue on upcoming flights, the fuel diffuser has been redesigned to better direct pressurized gas into the main fuel tank and substantially decrease the strain on the diffuser structure. The new design underwent a more rigorous qualification campaign, subjecting it to flight-like stresses and running for more than 10 times the expected service life with no damage. And so let's get back to talking about Ship 36. On Wednesday, June 18th, you guys have probably all seen the video at 11 p.m. Central Time, Ship 36, preparing for the 10th flight test, experienced an anomaly while on the test stand that was quite explosive. The vehicle was in the process of loading cryogenic propellant for a six-engine static fire when a sudden energetic event resulted in the complete loss of Starship and damage to the immediate area surrounding the stand. As is the case before any test or launch, a safety zone was maintained around the test site and all hazards remained within the safety zone. There were no reported injuries or safety violations. The most probable root cause was identified as undetectable or under-screened damage to a composite overwrapped pressure vessel or COPV in Starship's payload bay section, which failed and resulted in a structural failure of the vehicle, causing subsequent propellant mixing and ignition. The COPVs in the payload section store gaseous nitrogen for use in the Starship environmental control system. To address this issue, COPVs on upcoming flights will operate at a reduced pressure with additional inspections and proof tests added before loading reactive propellants onto a vehicle. SpaceX has also updated its COPV acceptance criteria and developed a new non-destructive evaluation method to detect internal COPV damage. New external covers are also being added to COPVs during their integration, adding an additional layer of protection and visual indication of potential damage. So I really love just how open SpaceX is about what went wrong, what they learned, what they're doing to fix it and telling us when the next test will be so that we can all hopefully plan to be there if we choose to be there. And you know what? If you don't want to come because they're not catching the booster, I don't blame you. It's kind of hard to get to Starbase. It's expensive, and you'll have to take time off work because if you are ever planning to see a rocket launch, particularly Starship, when it's still in the early days and we don't have the cadence of Falcon 9, you you might have to you know wait in case it gets scrubbed a few days. So just be aware of that. But I do plan to be down there, so if you are also planning on going, make sure to say hi to me. Thanks so much for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one.